This will be the next lesson for the Bible Institute. We made it through the covenants, dispensations. We went through the whole Bible and looked at how God has dealt with man throughout the Bible. We've looked at how God's plan worked out throughout the Bible. Now we're going to get into the seven series, you know, the seven mysteries, seven resurrections, seven judgments, seven baptisms, and all those. And we're going to start with the seven mysteries. And if you can get these seven mysteries nailed down, this will really help you put your Bible together. You know, you can go back and um, go through all those covenants and dispensations and then come back and start on these. And it'll really help you nail everything down in your Bible. We're going to start with the mystery of godliness. I think this is the most important of the mysteries. Of all the mysteries, I think this is the most important. It's in 1 Timothy 3, 16. There's a lot of good 316s in the Bible. You know, you got John 316, and then you got 1 Timothy 316. Okay, let's look at it. 1 Timothy 316. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So first off, let's talk about how it is a mystery. Why is this a mystery? Why is God being manifest in the flesh such a big mystery? Well, one reason is because a holy God revealed himself a holy God manifested himself as a humble man. Think about it for a minute. You look up in the sky, you see all those stars, you see the sun, you see the moon. You see all the wondrous things that are made in the earth. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. You see all the things that he made. But yet he came down in flesh as a humble man. That's a mystery. How could a holy God with infinite wisdom, light years beyond our mind, light years beyond, even more so than, you know, you look at an ant on the ground and you're really far advanced compared to that ant. You may not be the smartest person in the world, but compared to that ant, you're pretty smart. God is even infinitely times more smarter than you than you are that ant. But yet, God manifested himself in the flesh as a humble man and didn't act like he was any better than any other man when he came. So it's a mystery because a holy God revealed himself as a humble man. Romans 8, 3 says, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's a mystery how a holy God, he come down and put on the likeness of sinful flesh. God came down and put on skin. You know, one day, way back when, back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And the Bible talks about, how from dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. God came down and put on that dust. He, he put on skin, likeness of sinful flesh. How could a holy God do that? I mean, me and you were animated mud balls. And he came down and put on the same skin that me and you walk in. You know, they talk about how don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes. 
God came down and walked 33 years in your shoes and was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's a mystery how a glorious God would put on undesirable flesh. He didn't just, he didn't come, when God came down in the flesh, he did not put on skin that was going to get him on the cover of a magazine. He did not put on skin that would make all the women love him because of how he looked. He came down in undesirable flesh. It even talks about in Isaiah 53, 2. It says, He hath no form nor comeliness, and we shall see, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He didn't even give himself the advantage of putting on beautiful flesh, even by our standards. He came down and just put on normal-looking skin, nothing making him look any better than anybody else. This shows godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. This shows that godliness is not a show. This shows godliness is not about drawing men through beauty and flash and nice clothes and perfect skin. But contrast this with the myst another mystery that we'll talk about in another lesson, the mystery of iniquity. Now, the mystery of the iniquity has to do with the devil and the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist. It's the complete opposite. It, it looks like it. The mystery of iniquity tries to look like the mystery of godliness, but it's actually the opposite. Because the mystery of godliness is not a show. It doesn't put on a front. It's not pretend. It doesn't draw men through beauty. It draws men through the truth. The mystery of iniquity, the devil, the Antichrist, will clothe wickedness with beauty, with false religion with fake godliness just like the pharisees in matthew 23 27 the lord said woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye are like unto whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness he said they're like whited sepulchers you know you get a really nice coffin but what are you putting in it dead men's bones it looks good on the outside but it's dead on the inside that's the way the mystery of iniquity operates it makes the outside look good the inside looks bad what you got with godliness is it doesn't matter about the outside it's about the inside when the Lord came down and manifested himself in the flesh, he didn't come in some skin that was going to attract the world because of how it looked. He came down and manifested himself in normal-looking flesh, and that's a mystery. He could have made his flesh look like anything he wanted to. You know, if you had the choice, you would change all this stuff about yourself and make you look a certain way. The Lord came down. He just looked like a regular guy. There was nothing about him, the way he looked, that would just draw in crowds just because of the way he looked. It's a mystery because the God of the universe left the riches of heaven to come down here to a bunch of bums like us, a bunch of sinful men like us, and please us. And you don't realize, you think so highly of yourself and the people around you that you don't realize how big that is. It's just like, once again, an insignificant bug on the ground, even worse than this. Imagine if you love those bugs on the ground so much, you came down and spent uh, 33 years trying to please those bugs trying to work for those bugs, do something for them. It's even an infinite times more amazing than that.
God came down, the God of the universe, the God who hung the stars in the sky, the God who parted waters, the God who made the oceans, came down not to please himself, but for us. In Romans 15, 3, it says, For even Christ pleased not himself. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. An insignificant scum sin bag like me, he came down that so that I could be rich through him. If God's purpose was to please others and not to draw attention to himself, then we should please others and not draw attention to ourselves. If the God of the universe could come down in humility, you as a sinner should be able to put others first and show humility. I mean, just like Paul said, for if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. If God manifested himself in the flesh, if he came down here and didn't parade himself around like he's some big shot, you ought to be able to parade yourself around like you're not some big shot. What do people commonly say? They say, look out for old number one. They say, I've got to put me first. They say, I've got to make myself happy. They say, if I don't take care of myself, nobody else will. Everybody's always looking out for themselves. They put themselves first. Isn't that funny how me and you will put, each, put, put ourselves first, yet the God of the universe manifests himself in the flesh and came down to put everybody else first. The Lord Jesus Christ is king, and he came down and became a servant. In Philippians 2, 6, it says, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He's a king, but he came down, became a servant. He humbled himself and died for a bunch of people like us. So, you're a king. If you're saved, you're a king. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, He hath made us kings and priests. You're a king. You're a king's kid, but you should become a servant. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. If you're going to follow in the Lord's steps, you got to be a servant. Everybody's mindset is serve me, serve me. But if you're following the Lord's steps, you serve others. So God is manifested in the flesh, and it's a mystery. God was manifested in the flesh, and God came down and experienced life as a man. That's another way it's a mystery. It's a mystery because a holy God revealed himself as a humble man. Nothing flashy, nothing special about his skin that he put on and it's a mystery because God came down and experienced life as a man think about it for a minute when Jesus Christ came down in the flesh he would have had to have gotten his diaper changed he would have been rocked to sleep he would have got hungry he would have been burped by his mother he got tired he sweated, he got thirsty, he had all the discomforts that a man would have going through a life of 33 years. God did that. He, he went through all that. 
So why did he do that? What's some reasons why that God came down to experience life as a man? One reason is he came down to be a model for man. He came down to be a pattern. In 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. He suffered for you. He left a place where there is no suffering to come down here in this awful world and suffer to leave us an example to f so that you could follow his steps he wanted to be a model you know the saying people say i'm not going to tell you to do something that i wouldn't do he came down and did everything that he wanted you to do so that you could follow his steps to give you a pattern to follow he gave you the tutorial or instruction for life you want to know how to live look at the lord jesus christ and act like he acted it says in first peter 2 22 who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously He came down to be a model for man. Another thing, he came down to make mo a mockery of the devil. The devil probably said to the Lord, you don't know what it's like to be a man. If you were a man, you wouldn't do any better than they did. If you had to be, if you had to go down through there and have pain and sorrow and sickness and, and all the stuff that they experience, you wouldn't do any better. He probably said, don't judge a man till you walk a mile in his shoes. So the Lord's like, okay, I'll, I'll walk in his shoes. So he came down and lived man's life better than any other man. He came down to make a mockery of the devil. And he, he did it all right. Everything from the, from the cradle to the cross. It was all perfect, all sinless. And when he was on that cross, he made a mockery of the devil and unclean spirits it even says in colossians 2 15 and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it when he's on the cross he's saying come on is that all you got when he's getting beat he's like is that all you got is that all you got lucifer is that all you got unclean spirits he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it he came down to, another reason he came down was to make a way for a man to get righteousness. Why would a righteous God come down to die for a mess like us? He did it to make a way for us to get righteousness so that we could go to heaven. In Psalm 8, 4, it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? What are we that a holy God should come down and die for us. That's a mystery. So insignificant. Such a short life that's less than a vapor compared to eternity. Yet the Lord came down to die for us. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He came down as a man to make a way for man to get righteousness. Man sinned, so God had to come down as a man to die for man. So it's a mystery. The next thing I want to go into is how God was manifested in the flesh. This was God manifested in the flesh. I want to make that completely clear. It's not just a man manifested in the flesh. It's not, as the new versions say, he was manifested in the flesh. It's God was manifested in the flesh. You see, Jesus didn't just begin in a manger one day. You go back in the Old Testament, you see him in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. You look back there in Genesis chapter 3, you see the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
you look back there in Genesis, you see the angel of the Lord wrestling with Jacob. You look back there at the beginning of Exodus, you see the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. You look back there in Joshua, you see the Lord as the captain of the Lord's hosts. You see him appearing to Manoah in the book of Judges. You see that angel of the Lord keep popping up all throughout the Old Testament. He's the fourth man in the fire. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Lord manifesting himself where people could see him on this earth. He didn't just begin in a manger. You look back there, you see him present in the creation. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, that's the Lord. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, that's a mystery. How was the Word with God, and yet the Word was God? Our pea brains can't handle something like that, but that don't mean that it's not true. It's true. In the beginning was the Word, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, yet it says, and the Word was God. John 1, 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He didn't just begin in a manger. He was here before everybody. He was here eternity past. He'll be here eternity future. Colossians 1, 16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, or they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So before the devil, before Lucifer, before the angels. He was here before Lucifer, before Lucifer became the devil. He was here before Michael, before Gabriel, before the cherubs, before the seraphims. And he's holding it all together. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. If it wasn't for him, I would just blow up in a million pieces. You would just blow up in a million pieces. He didn't just begin in a manger one day. He proclaimed himself to be here before Abraham. In John eight fifty six, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, he said. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. He proclaimed to be here before Abraham. Another thing is, He is God according to many witnesses. God manifested in the flesh according to many witnesses. Here's some witnesses. Here's some people that testify to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Did you know that the Father called the Son Lord? In Psalm 110 and verse 1, it says, The Lord, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou, at that, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Father calls the Son Lord. The Father said, Let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1, 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God. It's forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. You see that? The Father is saying, in verse 8, it says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's God calling the Lord Jesus Christ God. How do you explain that? I can't. It's a mystery. It goes beyond my pea brain. We can't fully understand God. We can't fully understand the Godhead. But we know that there are three that bear record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That's as far as you can go with it. There are three. These three 
are one. The Father himself calls Jesus Christ God. The unclean spirits testify to it. Even his enemies testify to it. The unclean spirits in Mark 1, 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the capital H, holy, capital O, one of God, the holy one of God. In John 14, 9, Jesus himself testifies to the fact that he's God. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? That's God manifest in the flesh. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Did you know that the Lord says that the Lord sends himself? That's Jesus Christ at the first coming. That's, that's God manifested in the flesh. In Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. In the millennium, Jesus Christ comes down, sits on a throne, that's God sending God down to reign on the earth. See this in Zechariah 2.11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Now notice this. And shall be my people. This is the Lord talking. He says, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. The Lord just said that the Lord sends him. That's a deity of Christ verse showing you that he's sent by the Lord and he is the Lord. He said, and shall be my people and I will dwell in the midst of thee and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. The Lord just said that the Lord sent him. So the Lord says the Lord sends him. That's something that's hard to explain. It's a mystery. But... It's a mystery, and God was manifested in the flesh. Now let's talk about the importance of the virgin birth. Why is that important in all this? So, the, virgin, the fact that he was born of a virgin shows you he fulfilled prophecy. In Isaiah seven fourteen it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He fulfilled that prophecy. In Matthew one twenty three, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. They shall call his name Emmanuel, and that name means God with us. But you're going to deny that Jesus Christ is God when his very name means God with us. In Matthew one twenty four, Then jo Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Showing you that Joseph did not have sexual relations with Mary until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. He did exactly what the angel told him to do. Mary was a virgin. She was the a virgin she'll conceive. She was that woman that we talked about in Isaiah seven fourteen. In Matthew one eighteen it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. This is important because if Joseph was his real father, then Jesus would have had a sin nature. He would have been just like me and you. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. If Jesus Christ had an earthly father, he would have had a sin nature. 
In Romans 5.12 it says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We're all sinners because Adam sinned, and from there on out, everybody's father sinned. Your father sinned, his father sinned, his father sinned, and it passed on like that. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. The sin nature didn't pass on through to him. Since he was virgin born, he bypassed the curse on this wicked king in the Old Testament. A lot of people don't know about this, so I want to go ahead and tell you this. Jesus being virgin born caused him to be able to bypass the curse on Coniah or Jeconiah. You see, Jeconiah, he was such an evil guy, the Lord take the J, took the J-E off of the beginning of his name. Didn't want it to be like Jehovah. Didn't want it to be like Jeconiah. He left it as Coniah. And you know what he said about this evil king? He said in Jeremiah 22, 28 through 30, he says, Is this man Coniah a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? He says, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. You see, both Joseph and Mary would have been in this guy's line. But you see, since the Lord was virgin born, he bypassed this curse. This curse that no man shall, no man of Coniah's seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. You see, Jesus Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is of the seed of David. But he was able to bypass this curse that's within this line here because he's virgin born. See, he got every angle covered. The virgin born is so important. Anybody who tries to tell you that Jesus Christ isn't virgin born, they deny this mystery of godliness. If Jesus Christ is not virgin born, then he's not God manifested in the flesh. He's just a regular man like me and you. That's what this mystery is all about. It hangs on the virgin birth. You have to believe that. And you've got a lot of well-respected, famous people who deny the virgin birth. They think that it's crazy, but they're crazy. Now let's really look at and break down each part of that first Timothy 3.16. Look what it says, and without controversy. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and without controversy. You know what that means? It means we're not going to argue about it. It's without controversy. It's a fundamental to the faith. If you are going to be somebody that's good for a Bible believer to fellowship with, then you can't make this into a controversy. You can't argue about it. You know, there's some things that me and you can agree to disagree on. You know, a lot of people don't like that saying, we can ad agree to disagree. But there are some things that we can say, you believe like that, I believe like this, it's okay, it's not that big a deal. But this is without controversy. This teaching here, we can't argue about it. we got to agree on it. For us to be able to fellowship as Christians, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. If you don't believe Jesus Christ is God, then you've just denied it all. The whole Bible hangs on 1 Timothy 3.16. If you don't believe God is manifested in the flesh, what do you got? What are you doing? Why are you, why are you even reading the Bible? If 1 Timothy 3.16 doesn't show you that Jesus Christ is God, Jesus Christ is the biggest liar that ever lived, the biggest fraud that ever lived, because he came down claiming to be God. And the whole Bible, your whole future resurrection hangs on that if he's not God manifested in the flesh you're wasting your time 
you're wasting your time with the Bible. You're wasting your time by trying to be a Christian. You're wasting your time with church. You might as well just go live it up like everybody else. It's without controversy. So, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery. It's a thing that was hidden, but now Paul revealed it to us. It's still hard to understand, but he's explained it to us a little bit. It's a mystery. And we went through how it was a mystery. How could God Almighty come down into the flesh as a humble man? How could God Almighty get tired, get his diaper changed, get burped, get hungry, get thirsty? It's a mystery. He's, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He came down in likeness of sinful men. He came down and revealed himself to us in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. According to the spirit, he's just. He's justified. He never sinned. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Holy Spirit testifies to the fact that Jesus Christ is justified. He never sinned. <clears throat> Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What's the next thing? Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels. The angels seen it. Peter talks about how, of which salvation the prophets, you know, the, the, the prophets spoke of it. Which things the angels desire to look into. The angels desire to look into the Lord. They can't, can't take their eyes off the Lord. They want to know more about the Lord. The angels do. If the angels can't take their eyes off the Lord... And they want to know more about the Lord. Then you ought to want to know more about the Lord and not be able to take your eyes off of Him. Because me and you are made a little bit lower than the angels. If they're amazed by the Lord, how much more should you be amazed by Him? He was seen of angels when He was born. He was seen of angels. When He was came down to be born as a man, He was seen of angels. An angel announced that He was coming. You know, he was seen of angels when he was tempted of the devil. The angels came and ministered unto him. When he ascended up into heaven, the angels would have seen it. When he went down into the heart of the earth, the angels would have seen it. Because they go back and forth through there. They carried Lazarus to Abraham's bosom area down there. You see that? And the Lord himself tells the angels to worship him. The angels desire to look into the things of the Lord. He was seen of angels. The next thing, he was preached to the Gentiles. You see, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Israel rejected him. And then you, you get in, into the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, they finally, they reject him one last time with the stoning of Stephen. Then Acts through 8, through the rest of the book, you see God dealing with the Gentiles, calls out the Apostle Paul, makes him a minister to the Gentiles, and the Lord is preached to the Gentiles. Well, okay, what's the next thing in 1 Timothy 3.16? He's believed on in the world. You must believe on him to be your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ has been believed on in the world. What's the next thing? He's received up into glory. Acts 1, 11, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He was received up into glory. He was given, Isaiah 9, 7, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The Lord gave himself to us. He's the son of, he gave himself as the son of God to us. He was given. When he finished his work down here, he was received back up into glory. If he wasn't God, he would have not been received up into glory. He would have been the biggest fraud and liar that ever was. If he wasn't, if he wasn't God, then he wouldn't have resurrected to even be able to be received. To even able to, he wouldn't have been able to even ascend up into glory. If he's not God, then. Your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. As, he ta as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ is not risen, then your faith is vain. Your preaching is also vain. You're doing all this for no reason. If he wasn't God, he would have stayed dead and buried in the ground. But great is the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 it's without controversy. It's great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. So seven things about this mystery of godliness. Seven things. Look at that. It's without controversy. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. There's seven great things there about this mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16. That he was, it's without controversy, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. This is your first mystery. It's the most important mystery. Without this mystery, the other mysteries are pointless. You see, you got another mystery about Christ and the church. If he's not God, why is he the, even the head of the church? There's a, another mystery about how he do, indwells you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If he's not God, he, he's not indwelling you if he's not God. There's another mystery, and that's about the rapture. If Jesus Christ is not God, there's not going to be no rapture. You're going to stay dead. You're going to stay down here. There'll be no rapture if he's not God. There's a mystery of iniquity. Without the mystery of godliness... There's nothing to compare the mystery of iniquity to to show you that it's a fraud. It, there's another mystery, the blindness of Israel. Why is Israel blind? Because they rejected G the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If he's not really the Son of God, then they, were in, they did no wrong. They, there's no point in them being blinded. You see how all the other mysteries... They also hang on the fact that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh.